Hello everyone, here we are again for another lecture on network and data communications and this time we'll be taking a look at voice communication concepts and technology. We start out looking at voice network concepts so this essentially is going to cover the uh, telecommunication side of things and uh, an in just interesting graphic there on the right that's an old switchboard out of uh, New York City circa 1898 that was actually in a, an attorney's uh, lawyer's office as I if I remember it correctly uh, but this is back in the days when uh, we had operators that uh, their job was to actually take cords and connect one circuit to another circuit to complete a call from point A to point B and of course that's changed uh, dramatically over the course of the last uh, over what would that be uh, 100 plus years now 112 years so the first thing we want to talk about with regards to voice network concepts is this fact that telephone calls are connected from their source to their destination via circuit switching and we talked about that in a previous um, lecture you might require remember that uh, circuit switching is uh, when you reserve the entire circuit from the source to the destination the example that I gave you was uh, reserving the highway between here and Las Vegas so that only your car could drive on it and nobody else could drive on it until you exited that highway and then another person could then be on that highway so uh, circuit switching and ties up the entire circuit uh, between the source and the destination only used by those that are communicating on both ends in, in this particular case uh, circuit switching originally meant that a physical electrical circuit was created from the source to the destination and these days we have virtual circuits and so they work a little bit differently because they actually use packet switching as their underlying technology the uh, <coughs> excuse me the modern telephone system is commonly known as the public switched telephone network or PSTN and you've seen that also in previous lectures we've shown you graphics of uh, two ends of communications connecting through the PSTN cloud and so again that's the public switch telephone network so here is the basic process that uh, occurs every time that we have voice communications uh, this graphic shows a telephone handset and uh, the handset is the the pink portion there that has both a receiver and a transmitter and so on the transmitter side there the, the bottom the mouthpiece at the bottom there as we speak the sound waves that we generate are vibrated to a diaphragm in the mouthpiece and there's some granulated carbon then in behind that diaphragm and by the diaphragm then vibrating the granulated carbon then actually conducts electricity into electrical waves and then that is put into the connecting cable then that attaches the handset to the base portion of the phone and then the base portion of the phone using RJ11 connectors connects the phone to a wall jack and uh, that's a two wire system there notice that the, if you look at the handset you'll see there's four wires because you've got the transmitting wire pair and then you've got the receiving wire pair so on the receiving end then the signal comes in electromagnetic signal comes into the base system and that gets passed off through the cable that connects the phone to the base system of course a lot of times these days we also have wireless handsets and don't have that physical connection between the handset and the base station um, but in this case in this graphic it's going through copper wires that uh, go that are connected to the the handset and now up to the earpiece the electromagnetic signals are carried up to the earpiece which uh, is connected to an actual electromagnet and so that electromagnet vibrates based on the electromagnetic current that flows to it and there's a speaker diaphragm then that is what actually vibrates converts the uh, electromagnetic signals into analog signals or sound waves and so it vibrates the air and converts the again the electromagnetic signals back into sound waves that we then hear in our ears 
One of uh, the main things that I want to point out here as far as connectivity anyway, make sure that you're familiar with the fact that telephone systems use RJ11 jacks between the base station and the wall jack. That's opposed to in data communications we use RJ45 jacks. Uh, in fact, RJ stands for registered jack. So there's all these different sizes of jacks, and each different jack size supports a different number of wires. So RJ45, for instance, the data communication connector, it supports eight wires. RJ11 has six connectors, um, even though we're only using uh, two wires in the case of the telephone system. Now, in the modern day switch telephone network, it's uh, all digital, and so we're going to have to convert the analog voice into a uh, digital circuit, and uh, we'll do that using pulse code modulation. And so it's, when you look at this chart here, what I want you to see is the frequency range of human hearing, which is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz and then the gray box in the center there is the full bandwidth of the analog circuit so remember that in the local loop this is now when we not in a digital service but in the local loop um, it's still analog connection between the house or the business and the central office of the phone company and so that bandwidth of that circuit is from 0 hertz to 4000 hertz and the actual bandwidth then that is used for the voice in the transmission of the full bandwidth is separated by a guard band on the bottom and a guard band on the top and so the actual bandwidth for the voice itself is from 3 hertz to 33 hertz This is a graphic you've seen before, the ba basic infrastructure of the modern telephone network. Uh, we've got the phone connected to a local loop, local loop to the CO. The CO has a trunk line to the POP, the point of presence of an inner exchange carrier. The inner exchange carrier then connects inter lata, and on the receiving end, then the POP on the right connects through a trunk line to the CO on the right which connects through a local loop to the destination phone there. And again, this has changed in the sense that a lot of you now have digital service all the way to your house. Um, in this slide, uh, that was not as common, and so the local loop is still considered to be exclusively analog. But that actually now is determined if you have Uverse or if you have Fios, that's going to be completely digital. The local loop will not be analog. But uh, those that still have just standard telephone service, don't have files, don't have Uverse, um, aren't using cable for sort of service provision, provisioning of their telephone system, their connection to the CO is still analog. So when you pick up the phone on your end and you get a dial tone, you're actually getting a signal then from a device known as a telephone switch which is a piece of equipment that is located and maintained at the central office of your local phone company. So when you dial a phone number then, based on that phone number that you're dialing, you'll either be traveling locally uh, within your LATA, intra-LATA, or you'll be actually going outside of your LATA, uh, inter-LATA, using the inner exchange carrier, which means that there will be an additional charge that's applied to that particular phone call. This graphic here then shows you the public switch telephone network hierarchy from the telephones, uh, telephone company's perspective. You've got your residences and your businesses on the left connected to a local loop, and if they communicate intra-LATA within their own LATA, then they're communicating perhaps with another central office within that LATA. And so there's a, a tandem office, which would be just a, another building that has telephone switches in it that is maintained by the local telephone company. And uh, it's just 
a way of making connection between all the different central offices within an existing LATA. Now, if we go outside of that gray box in this chart here, we go up from a class five, which is the local COs, up to toll centers, class fours, that's when now we're going inter LATA and we're actually incurring charges. And then as we get to even longer distances, you can see that your phone calls could be escalated up to uh, class three, which is primary centers, class two, sectional centers, and class one, which are your regional centers. And each time you go up the ladder there in this table, then you are incurring uh, additional fees as far as the transfer and connectivity of your phone call. So this slide just kind of reiterates some of the main concepts you saw in the previous slide. The original AT&T system was organized into the five class hierarchy, still a standard. The local CO is the lowest level of that hierarchy and the regional center is the highest level. This image here depicts a digital cross connect which is a network device that's used by telecommunication carriers and large enterprises to switch and multiplex low-speed voice and data signals onto high-speed lines and vice versa. Um, typically it's used to aggregate, combine together several T1 lines into a higher speed electrical or optical line as well as distribute signals to various destinations. For example, voice and data traffic may arrive at the cross-connect on the same facility but the destin, uh, destination for each is going to be different carriers. So the voice traffic would be transmitted out of one port, while the data traffic would go out another digital cross-connect system. Uh, DCSs is the acronym for uh, a digital cross-connect system, and uh, they're widely used in conjunction with central office telephone switches and may also be installed both before and after uh, one switch and is installed uh, in the form of like a card. If you look very closely there, you can see that these are just big chassis that you slide the electronic components into. So that way you can mix and match your port densities and your different uh, connection types and whatnot. Uh, cross connections are established via an administrative process. So this is part of the electronic components that are built into this uh, digital cross connect box um, and they're semi-permanent connections uh, whereas the telephone switch is actually dynamically picking up the dialing instruction and based on that information routing calls based on the telephone number that you're dialing. Cross connects come large, they come small, they handle sometimes only a few ports, sometimes up to as many as a couple of thousand ports uh, they handle narrowband traffic, wideband traffic, broadband traffic, and cross-connect support channels down to DS0 level. We're going to talk about digital service 0 level here in just a little bit. Uh, DS1, which is the equivalent of a T1, or DS3, uh, which is the equivalent of a T3. And we're going to talk about the bandwidth of each of those services here in just a little bit. So a telephone number like uh, an IP address uh, is a hierarchical arrangement then an addressing system that allows us to identify first kind of you know the large area that we're going to transport the call to and then within that larger area break it down into smaller areas and then eventually to the individual subscriber themselves so those uh, three components of the phone number are the three digit area code as you can see in the example down here at the bottom um, then we have the exchange number, which is essentially the central office that we're forwarding the call to. And then within that central office, the actual individual subscriber that is going to receive the phone call that we're dialing. So at a minimum, we have to have at least the exchange and the subscriber number. Not always required to use the area code. Obviously, I'm sure you've experienced that yourself. Now, in order to actually establish the phone call then from point A to point B, as you dial in that phone number, you're actually sending signals to the telephone switch to be able to establish the, uh, the phone call, the connection to the destination. And so in addition to your voice traveling over your 
telephone lines, you also have what are called system signals that are also traveling over those lines and the sound of the button that you press on the tel telephone indicating the number that you pressed on the telephone is uh, one type of system signal that is sent in this case from your phone to the telephone switch and then inner switch there's also signaling that's going on to also help establish that telephone call you'll also hear it referred to as inter-office signaling which would be the actual signaling then between COs or even inner exchange carriers and there's two ways two methods of putting the signal onto the system we can either have a separate pair of wires that's carrying the system the uh, system signaling separate from the voice or we can have the system signaling occurring along with the voice on the same pair of wires so when you're doing that when you have the voice and the signaling on the same pair of wires that's called in band signaling and when you have a separate pair of wires one set of wires that carries the signaling another set of wires that carries the voice that is called out of band signaling most home telephone telephones use in band signaling across the analog lo local loop now when you're pressing those buttons on the telephone what is actually happening this graphic is going to demonstrate to you exactly what is happening. Uh, the modern day telephone uses what is known as a DTMF dual tone multi frequency system. So that means there's actually two tones generated with each key that you press on the phone. So if you look at the first row which is one two three and the A here on the right and this right hand column by the way obviously is not on most modern phones this is uh, what you would find something in like uh, military installations government installations many times um, they use this fourth column here but the first row if you look to the far right you'll see that as you press say the one you're generating a tone at 697 hertz then when you release the button the value at the bottom of the column there so again if we press the one and you follow the one all the way down to the bottom of that first column you'll see the second tone that's generated is at 1209 Hertz or 1.2 kilohertz so two tones generated for each button that you press on the phone there so if you think about it then what's happening is you're identifying using system signaling the button that you press because the two tones are going to be unique for that particular button that you press. You know, no one or no two buttons, I should say, I guess within the, the phone keypad there are going to generate the exact same pair of frequencies. Each one's going to be individually and uh, unique. We've talked quite a bit about how data communications maps to the OSI model in this graphic you can see that the current signaling system that's used by the telecommunications system which is called signaling system 7 or SS7 also maps out to the OSI model now you're not going to be tested on this uh, in when, when I give you the skills test for the OSI model we're not going to be covering this this will be on your quiz this will be on your midterm but it's not going to be on the skills set for the OSI model we just focus on the data communications portion of the OSI model. But let's briefly take a look at what's going on at each of the layers here. First, uh, let's start at the top and work our way down. At the application layer there, there's a couple of protocols. There's the ON map, which is your operations maintenance application part. Provides standards for routing, management of the messages related to the network operations and maintenance. And then you have the TCAP, which is your transaction capabilities application part provide standards for routings management of non-circuit related information for transaction processing applications that are requiring out-of-band signaling. So O and MAP, in-band signaling, TCAP, out-of-band signaling. Um, then we work our way down to the network layer. Here we've got the signaling connection control part, the SCCP, which provides standards for routing and management of signaling messages not related to call setup between the switches a connection oriented service and it provides reliable message delivery 
then that combines with the MTP, the message transfer, transfer part, which provides standards for routing of the signaling messages between switches, and it is a connectionless datagram service. We'll talk about connection-oriented and connectionless a little bit later on when we get back to discussing how datagram or data communications protocols work. And then uh, one final component is the NS. P, the network service part, which is really just a way of referring to the combination of the SCCP and the MTP3. Signaling System 7, or SS7, controls the structure and transmission of both circuit-related and non-circuit-related information, and it is an out-of-band signaling method used between central office switches. So again, it's delivering the signaling out of band. It uses packet switched networks, which are physically separate from the circuit switch networks that are carrying the actual voice traffic. So now we're going to get into the voice digitization concepts. Um, I mentioned to you that the analog pot system has pretty much been replaced by digital systems. And so we're referring now between the central offices and between the central offices and the ex inter exchange carriers. Everything is, is digital now. The only analog components that are left with regards to the public switch telephone network would be the local loops. And even those now are being transferred over to becoming digital as well. So digitization, you should understand, is just simply the conversion of our analog voice into a digital format and then if need be back to analog before it reaches its destination. Of course that's completely transparent to the phone network users and there are a limited number of ways that the electrical pulses can be varied to represent an analog signal. We actually looked at these methods a little bit earlier on um, in this book. First we have the PAM, the pulse amplitude modulation. So again we've talked about this previously simply varying the amplitude of the analog signal is going to identify the um, in a digital fashion it, it represents what the analog signal looked like as it was being digitized so what we do in, in, in voice digitization is we're sampling the voice sound the analog sine wave at a rate of 8,000 samples per second and so then we're just capturing what that wave looks like at that point in time at each one eight thousandths of a second and so that's what this graphic is showing you here. Now truly when you look at the numbers on the left of the graphic there from zero to eight the range there would would actually be from zero to two hundred and fifty five um, because we use an eight bit system and so that means that there's actually from 0 to 255 different levels that we can represent as far as the amplitude of the analog signal. Next we see PDM which is pulse duration modulation so this is very much like uh, frequency modulation that we talked about earlier so in this case we're actually measuring the distance um, between the points here. So that's the duration portion of that that's being captured uh, of the analog signal, the duration of the the uh, peaks and the valleys there, the analog signal, and uh, again convert it over to some sort of a digital value ranging from 0 to 255. And then this third method is the PPM, the pulse position modulation, which is actually a combination of both pulse amplitude and pulse duration. And then finally PCM, or pulse code modulation. This is the method that is actually used by the telecommunications system. And you can see again that what we're doing is we're sampling 8,000 times a second what the actual analog signal looks like. And so in this example here, the very first sample, which is at one eight thousandths of a second, 
the digital conversion is to a string of bits, 8 bits. If you're looking at the bottom left of the screen there, you'll see that the, the uh, binary value is 1000000, which when you translate that back into decimal, that represents the number 128. And we'll talk about the, the binary conversion here a little bit later on too. But this one, this very first binary bit, is turned on to a 1, and it's in the 128 column in an 8-bit system. Now, if you move over to the right, to the second red dot that you see within the chart here, you see that that red dot is at 192, and so now we're converting that into binary in sample 2 down here at the bottom. And you see that the, now there's two bits, the first two bits, that are turned to 1. So the way that this works is the first column always is the 128 column. So if you have a 1 turned on in the 128 column, you take that number and then you add it to any other 1's that are turned on. In this case, it's the second column. The second column in an 8-bit system is the value of 64. So we take 128, we add 1 to, sorry, 128, add 64 to it, and then we come up with 192. Now let's look at the third pulse here and the, that's the third red dot that you see in the graph and that is at a value of 160 so let's go down now to the binary representation of that sample 3 at the bottom of the screen again the 1 is turned on in the 128 column but this time we have a 0 in the 64 column and a 1 in the 32 column so each of these columns are representing the power of 2 128 is, is 2 to the 7th power, 64 is 2 to the 6th power, um, 32 is 2 to the 5th power. Later on when we get into subnetting, I've got a table that shows you how all of this works. Um, but just right now I'll, I'll kind of quickly introduce you to it. Again, these are 8 bits here. If you start at the far right, you've got 2 to the 0 power. So that column, the value, the decimal value of that column would be a 1. Now if we double that, we go over to the second column. So working from right to left, second column would be 2 to the first power. That means that that value is a 2. Now if we move 3 bits over from the right, the third column now, we've doubled the previous column. This is the decimal value of 4. That's 2 to the second power. We move over another bit. We're at the fourth bit from the, le from the right now and that's uh, 2 to the third power which is going to be 8 and then we double again 16 in the fifth column there and that's 2 to the fourth power and then we come over to the uh, sixth column and that's going to be 2 to the fifth power which is 32 one more column to the left 2 to the uh, sixth power 64 and then finally the last column in the left there um, is 2 to the 7th power or 128. So each column is just assigned a decimal value starting with 2 to the 0 power and wherever the 1's are you just simply figure out what is the value of that column you add up all the 1's you know the value for each of the 1's what column is it in add those values all together and, and that's really how you convert binary into decimal and again we'll go into this greater detail when we get to our subnetting chapter. Now I know this is the tough part because we're getting into some of the binary math here of how digitization works. But just again, remember that in the telephone system, we are listening to the analog wave. And this is when I say we, we're, I'm talking about a, a telephone switch that's going to convert the analog sound into a digital representation of that sound it is sampling the analog wave 8,000 times a second and for each one of those one eight thousandths of a second where it captures a sample it uses eight bits to represent what the value of the wave is in fact here's the table I was just telling you about I forgot that this graphic was in this chapter here so you can see very clearly how the binary representation of decimal values works. The first row here is the powers of 2 that I was telling you about. So if you start from the right, 
you can see it's 2 to the 0 power, 2 to the 1st, 2 to the 2nd, 2 to the 3rd, 2 to the 4th, as we're moving to the left, 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 6th, 2 to the 7th. So that's eight columns there, right? So eight different bits being used there. When you translate each of the powers of 2 into decimal, that's the gray row that you see. 2 to the 0 is decimal 1. 2 to the 1st power is decimal 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 cubed is 8. 2 to the 4th, 16. 2 to the 5th, 32. 2 to the 6th, 64. 2 to the 7th, 128. Now the pink row that we see then is the actual capture of that one sample at one eight thousandths of a second. In this case, the bit representation of the sample is showing us a 1 in the 128 column. The rest of the columns are all 0, so that just simply means that that's the binary way of representing the decimal value 128. Now when we come down below here in the third step, they're just showing you there visually how the transmitted digital code is representing the, the measured amplitude. In other words, we're transmitting a 1 in the first position to represent that there's a, a 1 as the first bit out of the 8 bits and then there's no pulse that's being uh, electrical pulse, you know, there's no hump, as you can say, in, in the electromagnetic wave there, that red line that we're seeing. Um, so that means the rest of the bits are all zero. And so that's the whole concept of how pulse code modulation works. The actual technology that is doing the conversion from analog to digital and, and digital back to analog is called a coder decoder or a codec for short. So that's the, the actual device technology that's sampling that analog POTS transmission and uh, converting it into bits, to binary values, and uh, of course it becomes streams of bits as we put it into the digital network. Um, each codec outputs a digital signal at 64 kilobits per second. So that means that we're identifying 64,000 bits per second. That's the bandwidth of the basic unit of the telecommunication system. That's known as DS0, or Digital Service Zero. So everything in the telephone system is based on DS0, multiples of DS0. And that means it's multiples then of 64 kilobits per second. So if you think back now to how PCM works, we're doing 8,000 samples every second. And at each sample, we're actually capturing, we're recording 8 bits. We're using a combination of zeros and ones, 8 of them, to represent what that wave, that analog wave, looked like at that particular point in time when we're sampling it. So if we're, a we're sampling 8,000 times a second and each sample we're capturing 8 bits, that means that we are capturing 64,000 bits per second, or 64 kilobits per second. So again, DS0, Digital Service 0, is the very basic unit of the entire telephone transmission system. Now when we start getting into multiples of it, when we get higher service levels, a T1 line would be an example of that. A T1 line is a combination of 24 DSO channels. And so a T1 line gives us 1.544 megabits per second which is basically 24 times 64,000 plus there's a, a header bit for each one of the channels. In fact, I think we've got a graphic that represents that coming up. I just stopped the recording to see if that graphic I was thinking of that shows you the uh, conversion of 24 DS0 channels into a T1 uh, how all that works. I thought that was in this chapter, but apparently I'm wrong. It's, it must be in the next chapter. So right now, just the main thing that you want to take away from this at this point is that pulse code modulation is what we use in the American telephone system, and the uh, basic unit uh, is a DSO, D digital service zero, and that bandwidth is 64 kilobits per second. The rest of this chapter, they actually are just going through various uh, 
methods of voice transmission. And so we start out with some voice transmission alternatives here. Um, PSTN again, traditionally been the cheapest, most effective way to transmit voice, um, but there are alternate methods uh, that exist and certainly you need to be aware of those as an IT manager. So we'll look at the four items that we see here. Voice over IP, frame relay, ATM, and ISDN. As you're probably aware, IP is probably the most popular protocol used out there today at the network layer, um, mainly because of the internet. This graphic here then represents the topologies, the different ways that equipment can be connected together to provide for the voice over IP service. So this doesn't actually talk about the different services that are out there like Vonage, you've probably heard of them, and there's a few others um, that actually are companies that provide you with the voice over IP service, but you know within your own network you can actually even set up voice over IP. I know at the college um, we use IP based telephones. We have Cisco telephones and our whole telephone network is utilizing voice over IP. So these are just three different ways of getting everything all hooked up here. Uh, first we would have a point-to-point -point topology in which the PC would be the device that is actually what we're connecting our equipment to, like our microphone, to um, create the voice over IP environment. And so then that gets con connected to a modem, and as you know, the, the modem then would take the digital conversion, you know, as we speak into the microphone on the computer there, it's actually being converted digitally at that point by a codec, and then it's going to be sent into the modem in digital format, but to put it on a analog local loop to get it into a phone system, Again, remember, modem is modulate and demodulate, so it's taking the, the digital information, converting it to analog, sends it across into the public switch telephone network. Of course, the cloud, the PSTN, remember, is digital again, so now that uh, analog signal for the modem is being converted back into, um, the P using PCM as the codec, uh, back into a digital format. Comes out of the cloud on the other side, though, onto the local loop, again, as analog hits the modem on the receiving end, modem on the receiving end, takes that analog, converts it back to digital, and then the computer is going to go ahead and transmit the output of that sound over its speakers. So that would be one way. The uh, second method, it would be over a LAN, our local area network. This would be very similar to how we use it here at uh, MSJC. And so all of the computers are connected to, in this case, they show you a hub. Again, modern day, most likely it's going to be a switch there. But just over our standard Ethernet network, um, we're just going to transmit the digital captured voice from one of the computers that would be the sending system and then it would remain digital throughout until it got to the receiving end and then of course converted back on the receiving computer um, into an analog sound out uh, its speaker. And then if we want to go long distance, which like when we go between campuses, um, the only real difference here is that the computers still being connected to a hub or a switch are going to need to be routed to get to their destination. Now the uh, pink cloud that you see in the bottom graphic is correctly showing you two different ways. One would be to use the public switch telephone net I'm sorry, the, uh, <laughs> the public uh, packet switch network which is our the internet. Um, so that would mean that uh, perhaps I want to communicate um, from the college to you at uh, your house or your business. So most likely then we would use the internet in between. Um, but again, in the case of the college, when we go between campuses, we have what's called an intranet. So we're actually going from one local area network at one campus site to another local area network at the other campus site. And so we have to use a router to actually forward that traffic from one site to another over our intranet. Frame Relay has been used quite a bit for data traffic. It can also used, be used for uh, voice traffic as well. Uh, so in this example here, what they're showing you is uh, actual telephones being connected to uh, PBX. 
And by the way, I just got to thinking in that previous graphic, we could have used telephones as icons too. Um, you don't have to always use a computer connected to the local area network. Um, if you take a look, if uh, you come into room 970, uh, we have uh, Cisco, a Cisco telephone up on the instructor's desk there, and that's a, a voice over IP phone, c connects directly to the local area network, and then uh, communicates with the entire telephone system at MSJC. So this is kind of similar to that. They're just making a connection now to the PBX system. We're going to get, at the end of this chapter, we'll have a discussion about how PBX works. Uh, most companies don't want to uh, have separate phone lines that are maintained by the public telephone company. They want to have their own internal phone system. And so what they do is they have trunk lines like T1 lines that uh, are connecting to the CO to their PBX system and then internally the they manage their phone traffic using their PBX system. So just uh, the main thing here is to, to look at the top left gray box and follow the voice line down to this device that has that FR in the little circle icon. That's a FRAD. That's a frame relay access device. So that's the device then that takes an analog signal and converts it over into a digital signal and then you can see if you follow the frat out to the right the line becomes red so what that's showing you is if, if you look at the bottom left gray box there's a data network so there's computers that need to send data also over the frame relay network so they're just showing you that we combine both we're taking the analog voices converting them to digital and then of course the data is already in digital format and then putting them onto our frame relay backbone. Now if we're going between sites there may actually be a frame relay cloud. You actually subscribe to a service, a frame relay service that makes the connection from one location to another. Uh, you know, or In fact, I was going to say it could be local but actually that wouldn't be the case. A frame relay is pretty much what we call a wide area network service. In other words, it's used to connect multiple sites. Um, you wouldn't find that in use within a l uh, uh, one site. You wouldn't find that in a local area network or in, in an intranet. So again, it's just the main thing to see here is this FRAD. The FRAD is the conversion device, the one that's taken the analog, converting it to digital, and then on the receiving end, doing the reverse, taking the digital signal, convert it back to voice, and on the right-hand side now, putting it back into the PBX so it can connect to the destination phone there. And then they make a point of the fact that we're not using the public switch telephone network here at all. We're, we're, you know, technically speaking, we're really going over the same lines um, through the telecommunication system, but we're using a separate network. So they're actually separate switches. They're frame relay dedicated switches within the telephone system. Um, and so it's called a frame relay network. So it is, it is completely separate physically from the public switch telephone network. Then we have ATM or asynchronous transfer method and this is pretty much like frame relay. The only difference is that frame relay is variable length frames like Ethernet is and ATM uses fixed length cells. Um, otherwise the concepts are still pretty much the same here. You've got this analog based PBX system needs to be converted into digital and so you have a, a device that is capable of converting the um, data, the I'm sorry, the uh, analog voice into digital, and then formatting it into these ATM cells, putting it onto an ATM network. That's the ATM cloud we see in the center there. And then on the other end, we've got a another ATM device that is capable of converting the digital back to voice, sending it into the receiving PBX system, which is where the, the destination phone is connected to there. And again, with both frame relay and ATM, notice too that again we're combining, or we had the capability of combining voice and data and run both over the same networks. Our fourth alternative to PSTN voice communications was, or is, ISDN, the Integrated Services Digital Network. And so it is also capable of transmitting voice and data simultaneously, as we saw with the ATM and frame relay networks. In fact, when you think about it, 
all these different networks are still using the telecommunication system. It's just that there's different switches that are used within the system um, because each service uh, has a different way of framing the information. And so in a frame relay network, you're connecting to frame relay switches at the central office. Uh, same with ATM and ISDN. You're just connecting to those um, basic ATM or ISDN switches at the, at the central office. And so they form their own network that is separate, physically separate from the public switch telephone network. In uh, ISDN, there's actually two different services. There's the primary rate interface, which is PRI, P-R-I, and the service we're actually looking at here is ISDN BRI, or B-R-I, the basic rate interface. And so in the ISDN BRI, there are two channels that are known as the B channels, or the bearer channels, that can carry either voice or data, and each of those channels is 64 kilobits. And then there's also a third channel, which is known as the D or the delta channel, and that's the out-of-band signaling channel for the ISDN communications. So again, the advantage with ISDN um, is because it has two channels, you could actually have voice going over one channel while you have data, data being transmitted over the other channel. So this is just a visual representation then of that statement I made last. Um, top part of the graphic, we've got two PCs communicating over the ISDN network, and that's data being communicated. And in the bottom portion of the graphic, there's an analog telephone connected to a, uh, an ISDN modem, which can then convert the voice, the analog voice, uh, into a digital format. Now, one of the things you'll notice, too, is that the local loop here um, is digital. So it's still using the same copper wires that make up the local loop. And again, this is a little bit different in the newer Fios and Uverse systems. But uh, it, the, the old way of doing things, um, we still had the, the same old two copper wires going from the household or the business on the local loop to the CO. The difference being, though, that the signal was converted at the source, at the sender, uh, from the analog format, in the case of the telephone, into digital. And, of course, with the PC, then it, would, it remained in the digital format. It didn't have to be converted, like in the old days of modems, from the PC's digital format to analog. So that was one of the big advantages that ISDN provided, was the fact that no longer did we have a analog usage of the local loop, but we had digital signals now being transmitted over the local loop. Next we get into wireless voice transmission methods and before there were cell phones there were mobile communication devices that used radio frequencies that were known as radio telephones. In fact uh, walkie talkies could also be included in this category. So with the radio telephone system you had a central tower usually one per city and it would support about 25 channels per tower. There was a couple of limitations to this method. First of all, because there was a centralized antenna um, as opposed to numerous um, cell sites like we have today with cellular phones, then the transmitter itself, which meant the phone in the automobile, had to have a pretty powerful transmitter in there, big enough to be able to transmit 40 or 50 miles. Um, also, there was not very many channels supported on these individual uh, towers, and so that meant that there just weren't really enough channels to be able to support having lots of radio telephones within a particular city. So then Cellular came along, and they divided the city then into a bunch of small cells, and that allowed then extensive uh, frequency reuse across the city, so that millions of people could use cell phones simultaneously. And a good way to understand the sophistication of a cell phone is to compare it to a CB radio or a walkie-talkie. Because there are multiple frequencies available for communications. Now in the case of a CB radio or a walkie-talkie, those were half-duplex devices meaning that you could only transmit and then you'd uh, 
release the button. If you think about how a walkie-talkie works, you hold down the button and you speak into it, you transmit, and then you release the button to hear the response coming back. So you can only have one transmission on the channel at any given moment. Cell phones, however, are full duplex because you can have one frequency used for transmission from one end of the conversation and then you have a different frequency being used for the other end of the conversation. So that means that both people can talk at the same time. A walkie-talkie or a CB radio typically has about 40 channels, whereas a cell phone can communicate on 1,664 channels or even more with newer technologies. The range of a walkie-talkie is about one mile if you have a .25 or quarter watt transmitter. Uh, CB radio has much higher power so it can transmit much further, about five miles using a five watt transmitter. Cell phones don't have to be all that powerful because they operate within cells and so the signal actually is moving from cell to cell as the person is moving around with the cell phone. So that gives cell phones an incredible range. As you know, you can be driving hundreds of miles and you can still have the same conversation going on the entire time. If you ever used a CB system, you know that uh, if there were several transmitters all trying to use the same frequency that it got really congested and, and caused problems. So one of the advantages with the cellular system is that the areas of a city again are divided into what they call cells, basically made up in 10 square mile chunks. And the uh, power of the transmitters are very low. So that way the frequencies can be reused the entire range of frequencies that's available to the cell system can be reused in each of the different cells because there's no overlap of the signals between the cells. And then each cell has a base station in it that consists of a tower and a small little building that has the radio equipment in it. You probably have seen those many times located throughout the city. You'll notice that as we put the cells together here it kind of forms this honeycomb shape so just realize that uh, the cells by definition are actually six-sided and so each cell is surrounded by six other cells. Um, a single cell in an analog cell phone system, which you really don't see analog cellular out there anymore, but in the analog cell phone system then it's using one-seventh of the available duplex voice channels in each of the individual cells so it has a unique set of frequencies and no collisions are occurring. Um, the service provider typically gets 832 radio frequencies to use within the city and again it's duplex conversation so you have to divide that by two and then there's also 42 frequencies that are used as control channels so, so those are like uh, the uh, out of band signaling that we've been talking about previously. So basically they're left over with about uh, 395 voice channels per carrier uh, within a given city. Now again, we're talking about an analog system here, and so it's just basically saying that within a given cell, um, remember that you've got s basically seven cells going on, um, you've got 56 voice channels that are available. In other words, 56 people can be talking to each other at a single time. And then each carrier in each city also is going to run one central office, which is known as an MTSO, or a mobile telephone switching office. This graphic then kind of represents the infrastructure of the cellular um, transmission system. So you got the user with the mobile phone handset up there on the top, which is probably larger than uh, the cell phones that we're using today, obviously. And so each user, of course, has their own personal telephone number that's assigned to the device that they're using there. And users have various needs of voice, data transmissions, fax transmissions, video transmissions. And uh, that whole service process is what you pay for when you um, subscribe to a cellular service. Like if you want internet service, you pay for that separately from your uh, cellular service. Uh, just the, the phone service, the use of, the, of voice transmission. And it used to be long distance service too, was separate, but uh, most places, most cellular systems now include that within the base price. 
And uh, of course your connection is actually being made to the personal communications system or really the telecommunications middleware which means that's connecting to your providers system uh, your Sprint, your Verizon, uh, you know, whoever the provider is for your cellular service and then uh, you've got all types of access to different services again that they provide things like paging um, you can connect to PBX systems, you can uh, connect to other cell systems, you could use uh, satellite systems, uh, even cable TV uh, is uh, attempting to get into this market and so that's why you see the question mark there in that graphic. And then also of course you can uh, also be connected to the public switch telephone network. So in other words if you wanted to call somebody on their their house phone, uh, their hardwired phone connected to their local CO over the public switch telephone network then of course you could do that as well. So all of that is being forwarded through your your cellular provider to the appropriate systems, the appropriate switches and whatnot. And uh, the uh, the other interesting thing, of course, then they have the cordless phone here uh, being attached to the public switch telephone network. Uh, most of us these days don't have the, remember what we were talking about earlier with the handsets, they're not actually hardwired to the base set anymore. Those are cordless phones using a wireless technology to communicate from the handset to the, the base system. So of course in order to get our phone calls into the cell system and keep track of those calls as they travel from one cell to the next, uh, there are cellular standards. Uh, this would be the different transmission methods here. We have uh, frequency division multiple access, FDMA, where each call is placed on a separate frequency. Then we have TDMA, the time division multiple access. This assigns each call to a certain portion of time, so they get time slots within a designated frequency. We saw that when we talked about time division multiplexing earlier. And then uh, code division multiple access, CDMA, which now a, a unique code is actually being attached to each call that's being transmitted and so that way the individual calls can actually be spread across all the different available frequencies. So now we'll look at each one of those methods individually. We start with our FDMA. It separates again the spectrum into distinct voice channels by splitting, splitting it into uniform chunks of bandwidth frequencies like a radio station. Each uh, station sends its signal at a different frequency within the available band. FDMA is used mainly for analog transmission. It is capable of carrying digital information, but it's not considered to be an efficient method for digital transmission. And it was used in the Advanced Mobile Phone Service, or AMPS, which is the early analog cellular phone systems. Now here's an example of the Time Division Multiple Access Method, TDMA, which is used primarily by AT&T and T-Mobile, um, also known as D-AMPS. And so this way we have more than one conversation per frequency because again it's assigning a time slot to each individual conversation. If you can think back to our discussion on time division multiplexing then this is pretty much the same method as that just doing it in a wireless fashion using radio waves. Uh, three, many, three times as many calls as the AMP system can be used uh, with TDMA so that's about 168 channels per cell Data transmission rate for this method is 9.6 kilobits per second and it is more technically limited than the next method we're going to take a look at which is the CDMA method. So here is CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access. This is used primarily by Verizon and Sprint and so now an actual you know think of it like uh, an IP address if you're familiar with IP addressing. We're just adding um, coding information to the messages as they're being transmitted and so that maximizes the number of calls that, we can, that can be transmitted within a limited bandwidth and it uses uh, spread spectrum as the transmission ta technique which actually helps to prevent interference with the calls um, it makes the calls more secure because people can't listen in on just one frequency to hear the conversation or to intercept in the case of digital um, packets for each call are marked with the code and it uh, was patented by Qualcomm which requires an 
percent royalty, and so that's why um, AT and T and some of the others decided not to use this particular method because they didn't want the additional cost. So, as you may or may not be aware, telephone uh, cellular telephone communications has really uh, progressed over the years and so there's a table in your book on page 193 if you want to take a look at this information uh, pretty much everything that we see here is included there as well so these are the, just the different generations you, you've heard the commercials where they talk about their 3G and 4G networks these days and so that's what they're referring to is just you know the generation that their system supports at this point in time so originally we had the pre-G technologies, uh, sometimes known as the zero-G system, and that would include things like enhanced paging, two-way text messaging or pagers, um, private packet radio, which was this uh, proprietary type of modem. Then we had the 1G networks. This is the original analog cellular networks, so AMP, uh, AMPS was utilized at that point in time, introduced in the U.S. in about 1983 by AT&T. Um, there's also cellular digital packet radio or CDPD. AT&T uh, used that service for a while. They uh, since discontinued it in 2004. And then came the 2G systems, and this is the TDMA CDMA battle that went on for a long time here. Um, AT&T and, and T-Mobile again used the TDMA, and Verizon and Sprint used the CDMA. Then came additional services that got added to the transmission methods of TDMA and CDMA. And so those were referred to at that time 2.5G. And, and uh, that included things like general packet radio service, GPRS, utilized by AT&T and T-Mobile. Again, that was based on their TDMA transmission methods, or it was utilized within those TDMA transmission methods. And then Verizon and Sprint had uh, the 1XRTT, so those were services that they could enhance or provide enhanced service uh, with uh, on their CDMA networks. Then the 3G came along. The uh, version that AT&T and T-Mobile had evolved to, so from their TDMA system, it evolved into the enhanced data for GSM evolution, also known as EDGE and Verizon and Sprint evolved into Evolution Data Optimized for Evolution Data Only, or EVDO. And so 3G is the most commonly utilized methods out there now, but of course uh, 4G is, is quickly coming on the heels here of 3G. And we're going to look at each of these generations in a little bit more detail here in our uh, 1G cellular system. Again, remember that was the AMP system. It was an analog system. It uh, operated in the 800 megahertz, megahertz frequency range. It used separate frequencies then for each of the channels. Frequency, frequency division, multiple access, FDMA. Had uh, significant limitations, often relatively poor signal quality, static, interference. Those were all inherent with that system. Um, and it could handle relatively few concurrent calls per cell. And the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, ended uh, any service requirements placed on AT&T, Verizon, and, and the lot, the rest that were selling the service at the time. Um, the FCC no longer required them to continue to support the AMP service as of uh, February 18th, 2008. Then remember to CDPD, Cellular Digital Packet Radio was another method of the 1G service. Um, it used unused bandwidth normally that was used by AMPS mobile phones between 800 and 900 megahertz. Its speed was 19.2 kilobits per second and the service there was discontinued in conjunction with the retirement of the AMPS system in 2008. So 2G cellular was the advent of digital cellular communications and so obviously there were significant capacity increases there compared to amps and carriers have steadily moved to digital cellular systems and that's kind of an old statement they all have exclusively moved to digital cellular systems in the case of 2G the call is digitized at the telephone handset and it is then sent in digital format to the tower 
Digital conversations can be compressed, which allows between three to ten digital cell phone calls to occupy the same space of a single analog phone call. More calls to share the common bandwidth in a cell concurrently. Quality is greatly improved. Better equipment to support wireless data transmission. So in addition to voice, then data transmission capabilities were now a reality. Uh, the 2 gigahertz bandwidth is allocated for digital cellular. And conversations are multiplexed using either TDMA or CDMA, depending on which service you're using. So here again is the 2.5G. Remember, this was just kind of an enhancement of the uh, TDMA, CDMA systems. And so one of those methods was the GPRS, the General Packet Radio Services, used by AT&T and T-Mobile. Again, that was based on the TDMA model. And uh, it's a wireless packet-based communication service. Until recently, it was uh, st the standard 2.5G protocol used in most smartphones. Unlike a circuit-switched voice connection, this is packet-switched, always-on connection, remains active as long as the phone is within range of any service, uh, which would be you know, cell tower. Uh, it allows smartphones then to do things like run applications remotely over a network, interface with the internet, participate in instant messenger service sessions, act as a wireless modem for a computer, and transmit and receive emails. Theoretical data transfer rate greater than 200 kilobits per second, although in actuality it's more like 56 kilobits per second. And some smartphones in the United States are still using this protocol, although the newer 3G faster protocols are uh, currently taking over there and as I said earlier too we're even going the next step we're heading for 4G here real quick. The competition for GPRS was the 1VRTT it was based on the CDMA model and it offered data transfer rates of up to 100 kilobits per second. Although 2.5G was utilized in some smartphones, the uh, technology just really didn't work as it was being touted to, to work. And so uh, it wasn't until really the advent of 3G technology that uh, a true multimedia cell phone uh, could be developed and, and utilized with reliability. And so again, those would be called smartphones. And uh, various features have increased bandwidth and transfer rates to accommodate web-based applications and phone-based audio and video files. Edge can transmit at more than three times the rate of the GPRS system, 384 kilobits per second. And so many smartphones in the U.S. are using the Edge protocol. And again, that would be if you're on the AT&T or T-Mobile service. And the competition for Edge is the EVDO, based on CDMA 2000. Gives transmission rates of up to 2.4 megabits per second in revision 0, up to 3.1 megabits per second in revision A, which that's um, really what 4G is all about. And again, that's used by Verizon and Sprint customers. So uh, when it comes to wireless data services, GSM is uh, one of the more popular ones. Uh, originally the acronym was for Group Special Mobile. It uh, was developed by a, uh, the Conference of European Post and Telegraph SEPT in 1982. And uh, it was researched basically for the telecommunication systems that were used in Europe. Uh, commercial service using the GSM system did not actually start until 1991. It uh, didn't use analog, it was digital. And then uh, it evolved into the global system for mobile communications. Or that's the modern day version of GSM. And so it's now an international standard. Uh, if you go to Europe, uh, any other part of the world, you'll probably see that GSM is the only type of cellular service that is available. Um, this actually overlies, it's a service layer that overlies uh, TDMA, so TDMA is like your data link and physical layers of the OSI model. Originally, it actually it was drafted for CDMA, but because of Qualcomm's patent and uh, wanting to get royalties uh, on CDMA technology, then the 
vendors and carriers, they weren't willing to, to standardize uh, the GSM on the CDMA technology, and so that's how it ended up with uh, TDMA. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we're right on the cusp of 4G right now. In fact, you can actually get 4G service in many areas. Um, and so it's been developed to accommodate quality of service and rate requirements that are set by all the newer applications that have been developed for wireless broadband access. And those include things like multimedia messaging, uh, video chat, mobile TV, HD TV content, uh, digital video broadcasting, and uh, even minimal services like voice and data and, and other services that will utilize the bandwidth. Some of the 4G protocols that are uh, specified are the uh, UMTS, the Universal Mobile Telecommunication Service, the WCDMA, Wideband Code Division Multiple Access, High Speed Downlink, Downlink Packet Access, SHSDPA, that's AT&T, and then Evolution Data Optimized Revision A, as I mentioned to you earlier, EVDOA, uh, which is for or being used by Verizon and Sprint. Here are some links that you can click on so that you can see the major cell providers uh, coverage maps and so the uh, maps will show you the 4G and 3G services and where they have coverage for those services so you can just click on any one of these links here and, and hopefully they're still up to date I actually didn't check those today to see that they are um, but give them a click and uh, see if the maps do come up for you. All right, so we're done with cellular. We're going to do one last thing here in this chapter. We're going to talk about PBX, private branch exchange. The idea here is really having uh, a privately owned telephone system within a company. And so it's uh, like bringing the, the telephone switches from the CO into the building of where the company's operating. So where they just have big trunk lines from the CO connect to the company's PBX and then the local PBX system can be used for um, you know like making calls from one extension to another within the company and they don't have to be processed by the the public telephone system at all. So uh, depending on the requested destination switch circuits are established, maintained, terminated on a per call basis by, by the PBX switching matrix. Here's a simple graphic representing a PBX system uh, PBX systems, uh, again, are kind of uh, circuit boxes that you can add and remove cards to. So as you increase the number of stations that your company needs, as far as phone stations are concerned, you can add more cards to a system. When you go out and you look, you have to you know, buy, buy a PBX system from a, a PBX provider. And so they'll usually sell you... Um, a base box uh, that will support so many cards depending on what you think your initial needs are and maybe your initial growth for the company and uh, sometimes they're limited to the initial size that you buy most of the newer stuff though is much better you, they're, they're much more expandable um, in fact a lot of them now are starting to be able to be integrated with uh, a lot of PC uh, computer technologies where in the past uh, PBX's were very much proprietary and so if you bought components from one vendor you pretty much had to buy all your new cards and whatnot from that same vendor so anyway these PBX boxes um, you know think of them kind of uh, as a combination of a phone switch and a, and a PC I mean they do actually have a CPU in there as far as processing is concerned uh, and there's a switching matrix so that's very much like a switch that we would see in a data network being able to switch the phone information from one card to another and so then as I said for each station or each phone that you're gonna have within the company you would actually put a card into this box and then you would wire the the uh, output of that card to a room within the company where the you know phones gonna be attached to the wall jack and then you can see on the right there there's also a, a trunk card and so this is where the the telco trunk lines come in and, and get attached to the PBX system Another thing that you can add to a PBX system would be an accounting system. So in other words, if you want to keep track of uh, the phone traffic that's being transmitted throughout your company there, 
um, by your PBX system, then all of that could be uh, maintained on a computer database. And then, of course, you could use software to generate reports from that so you could see what kind of activity is being generated within your, your system there. I haven't actually looked at the, the latest systems. And so in this graphic, they're using an RS-232 connection between the computer and the SMDBR. That's the, the accounting system card. And I can't swear whether that's still the case or not. I mean, RS-232 has been replaced in a lot of different areas by USB. And so it's very possible that USB or FireWire or some other technology might be used today instead of RS-232. But uh, you, know, you obviously have to have some. In fact, they might even have Ethernet uh, as a connection means. Um, but anyway, you've you got to have some way of having the computer connect to the the PBX system so that it can track the data, record it on the hard drive in a database. So as I mentioned to you, these PBX systems used to be very much proprietary. These days they're um, kind of more open systems like and uh, also capable of integrating all kinds of cool PC technologies with them. And so that's what CTI or computer telephony integration is all about. So this is kind of like a category of products, and so I've seen a lot of uh, cool systems out there where um, if you're in uh, some sort of a, a customer management environment where you get a lot of help system calls or uh, maybe uh, you, know, you get customer calls about certain products and whatnot that the company sells, um, you can have managers, the CMS managers can actually uh, record the individual operators' phone calls on their computers. They can uh, listen in to the phone calls and they can talk to the operators without the, the customer hearing what they're saying to the operators. Um, there's just uh, really a lot of new technology and, and whatnot that's coming down the pipe um, due to the fact that these PBX systems now are more standardized, they're more open, and they're more capable of being integrated with the uh, PCs that we have in the office place as well. So here's just one example of kind of the, the basic configuration that you might see in a, a CTI enabled environment. And so we've got our computers on the left there or in some sort of a CTI application. So like I said, it would be customer management software or something along those lines. And so you would have an actual card that's dedicated for computer telephony integration um, that gets it put into the computer system. And then the phone can actually be connected to the card. And then the card also is then connected to the PBX or directly to a public switch telephone network because you can also have um, outside companies hosting the PBX side of this. And so you would do that by connecting to the, those companies, the hosting companies, through the public switch telephone network. This graphic then is a little bit more complex than the last one that we saw. Uh, we still have the basic cards being put into the PC and then uh, in this case you'll notice the phones though aren't directly connected to the CTI cards that are in the PC. The uh, CTI is basically being run over the Ethernet network and then communicating with either a data server that you could look up like customer information um, and or a CTI server which would have the customer management system or the even phone based applications on there. And then you have the uh, automatic call distribution as one method of, that's where the phones you can see are being attached to, one method of handling all of the incoming calls that are coming into your customer service representatives and figuring out how to appropriately distribute those calls to each of your representatives and so that's um, again automatic call distribution ACD or again uh, you could have the PBX system also providing that service as well and so I can pretty much guarantee you if you work in any company of any size these days in addition to your regular IT duties you probably will have to deal with the PBX system as well so it's, it's good and important for you to understand some of the basic concepts and uh, terminology that's used with regards to those types of systems. So that does it for this chapter. Five is done and we're moving on to six. Talk to you then.